Good evening, and welcome to Ridgecrest Talk, the Thursday night of ver version. Uh, I'm your host here tonight, along with Robert Iram. My name is Al Huey. Uh, we're here every Thursday night from 6 o'clock to 6.30, uh, assuming that uh, the creek doesn't rise, I guess. Uh, tonight, we're going to kind of continue on with the discussion we had last week with uh, Scott Garver and Jerry Taylor regarding <coughs> decorum at council meetings. Uh, it was not a good night two council meetings ago, but, and I know Robert will agree with me, it's not the first time this, that type of thing has occurred. Definitely not the first time. Right. So. Uh, but I think it's one of those two-way streets, which we'll get into later. But tonight, uh, uh, for our first guest, we have Mr. Michael Neal. Thanks for joining us here tonight, Mike. Thanks for having me. Uh, and uh, kind of what uh, piggybacked off of uh, the meeting two weeks ago, uh, the exchange between Mrs. Acton and uh, Scott Garver. Uh, that during that incident we had the city's mayor get up out of his chair no city attorney or city's attorney excuse me thanks for correcting me no the city attorney Mr. Lemieux yes get up out of his chair like he was going towards Mr. Garver yeah he was One going could to assume he that. was headed behind the council people and I made it past uh, Councilman Holloway, and it appeared he was headed for the podium. Right. And uh, that responded uh, uh, with Mr. Neal writing an email to all the council members. Uh, the only one that responded was Lori, which we talked about last week. But let's get to your uh, reaction and your email. Uh, of that night's meeting regarding Mr. Lemieux. Uh, okay. Uh, first, uh, before I start, I just want to reference for anybody who would like to go look and decide about this conduct for themselves, they can look on the city website and go to the archive meetings and uh, look on the August 6th uh, video, part one. <coughs> and that this uh, these events we're talking about right now are, are at the two hour, 47 minute plus time frame. Uh, so it's real easy to go do that. Uh, <coughs> what I saw was exactly what, uh, what Al and Robert were talking about was, uh, and I was rather surprised, uh, <coughs> it's obviously the camera was off the podium, off of the, the podium and on the council members. Uh, you can hear Mr. Garver because he, he had not quite gotten up to the mic yet. Uh, but it was obvious from there that the angle of their heads, where they were looking, that he was over by the podium speaking, uh, and I think even Mr. Holloway was looked like he was motioning him, telling him to get up by the mic. Three times he did that. About three about times. Three times. Yes. Uh, and while you know he was speaking, and the mayor was trying to tell him basically to be quiet, to, you know, he had his chance uh, before and so forth. Uh, right about. To two hour 40, 48 minute time frame, you see, all of a sudden you see Mr. Lemieux, he's going across the back of, of the, the council dais there, uh, looked to be for all, you know, all intents and purposes, he was headed for the podium. And so I, I wrote to the council, and I don't have time to read the whole thing, but you know, I basically just just it. told them that this, this behavior on Mr. Lemieux's part was was out of line because number one, he's not even city staff. He is a contract employee working to advise them on matters of the law. But before you know, he even got up out of his chair, he was going, you know, Mr. Garvey, you're out of order. Mr. Garvey, you're out of order. Um, you know, you have to stop and think. Where is the chair of the board here? Why, you know, if he's really perceived to be out of order, why is the mayor telling him this? Why is the attorney even speaking up? So, so I wrote this, and, and Mrs. Acton wrote back and, you know, basically kind of tried to justify this. Uh, you know, we, we had a, several emails uh, back and forth about it. And, uh, you know, eventually at one point, Mr. Lemieux uh, 
<coughs> wrote back and basically uh, you know, said that he believed that there was some concern about Mr. Garver's demeanor and he didn't think the chief was still in the meeting. So clearly he's saying he thought Mr. Garver was going to do something dangerous and the chief wasn't there to, you know, collar him, so he was going to go do that. Uh, that didn't happen. He said, well, he talked to Mr. Garver after and to his credit, he said, I apologize if I got ahead of the council on this. Uh, after that response from him, then again, Mrs. Acton wrote, writes back and she basically is, is continuing to try to, to justify that. Uh, but in my mind, not very successfully. The, the thing that really struck me on all of these responses, not a one of them addressed the topic, which was, why was Mr. Lemieux acting this way or speaking as if he was the sergeant in arms? Mr. Lemieux didn't address it. He maybe explained why he did it, but not the fact that he did it. And uh, Laurie never addressed the topic, and of course, n no other council member ever responded to you, at least not that I'm aware of. No, none of, none of them did, except for Mrs. Acton. Uh, so, so why wouldn't they address the topic? I wonder. Uh, well, obviously, it's not a concern to the mayor. He's supposed to be chairing the meeting. He, there was no response from him. Uh, you have to assume, you know, the, the, the silence speaks for itself. He, he was in, has no problem with Mr. Lemieux's actions, no problem with, you know, I mean, council was, was cc'd on all of these, these back and forths between us, so they're all aware of what was said. Uh, and he basically saying nothing whatsoever, so he might, you know, you have to assume he condones what happened and it's okay with him. I, I must say that this is not the first time that Mr. Lemieux has done this. He has done this in the past also. Oh, really? I don't recall that. Yes, he has. Okay. He, yeah. For some reason, he enjoys playing sergeant at arms. Oh. Um, he has called out the same kind of thing, telling citizens that you know, they're out of order, they need to, you know, they need to sit down and be quiet. Uh, your next guest may wish to expand that, on that, that. That's really one of the handicaps because uh, we heard uh, from Mr. Taylor, I don't remember if it was on the show or uh, during the break. During a break, that. Uh, but well, we're going to have to get to that after we come back. <laughs> yeah. We're about ready to go to a break. Uh, we're going to take a break here. Come back and join us. We'll only be gone for a little while, and we're going to continue the discussion and bring in Mr. Rump. Welcome back to Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Robert Ironman, along with Al Huey. We've been talking with Mr. Mike Neal, and shortly we'll also be talking with Mr. Ron Porter. Um, but when we left you, we were talking about um, the email that Mr. Neal sent to the council and the fact that he got a response from Mr. Lemieux. And uh, I think that Al had something he yeah, wanted to Yeah, I had a up. thought, and I almost didn't get it back. Uh, we heard from uh, Jerry Taylor, and again, I don't remember if it was during the show or during the break, that uh, he tells us that Mr. Lemieux counsels the council to refrain from engaging with the public during public comment or agenda item. In other words, he uh, directs them to just sit there and listen what the public has to say and uh, kind of a uh, hand-over-the-mouth approach. Uh, but as we'll get into the the Brown Act, um, the council is only limited in not uh, addressing anything and voting on anything, I should say, that's not on the agenda. They can't take an action or perform right, an action. Right, they can't take an action. But they can interchange with the members of the public all they want. Okay. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to promote, that we think that if they would have more discussion with the public when they come up, um, a lot of these 
heated situations and frustration on both the council side of the DS and the public side uh, could be greatly reduced, if not eliminated. Definitely sure. agree. Let's move on. Uh, Mr. Porter, I'm pleased that you have been able to join us. And why don't you tell us about the um, uh, the email that you wrote after Mr. E, uh, Neo wrote, um, and then you were a party to that, and so you wrote addressing Mr. Lemieux. Well, I, I found it very difficult to understand. I'll pick up the microphone. Okay. I forgot I had to, had to get a mic. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I had had this discussion with Mr. Lemieux coming out and telling people that they had to sit down uh, prior to this, and I said, this isn't your position. This is for the mayor to do. Just some background. Um, with the Brown Act, it requires the meeting to be open to people. And, and I did a little more research after I wrote that particular memo, and, and the courts have found that Basically, when they start talking about people in the end, they opened up their, their First Amendment and their uh, liberty interest in being able to address it. The courts have said that they can't have a silent platform where they can't be challenged. And when they address someone individually, they have a right to address it in that same place because any other venue wouldn't be fair. Okay, so let me see if I understand what you're saying. Uh, you're saying that if I go up and say something to the council and they choose not to say something, I go back and sit down, and then later they choose to address that issue or me personally, I have a um, Brown Act due process to be able to respond. If they address you personally or get yeah. it out of context, the, the courts have actually not called it Brown Act. Their decisions were under Brown Act, but okay. they have said that you have a liberty interest and a First Amendment interest to be able to speak at the same time, to give you the same, the same venue to be heard. Okay. So then and that would definitely apply to what happened two weeks ago when Mr. Garver was trying to address Mrs. Acton's comments. Exactly. Right. It's, it's exactly. Uh, let's see. I was trying. Let's see. It's, but it says speakers who express their opinions freely must run the risk of attracting opposition. They cannot expect their opponents to be silenced while they continue to speak freely. Okay. And and certainly they, I know maybe sometimes would want us to not speak, but we have a right to speak. And and I wanted to bring something else up that you had in that email, and that was that there have been times when the public has been admonished for applauding or booing or making an, um, a two or three <coughs> word statement and they have called that disruptive and I believe that you found that in court cases uh, relative to the Brown Act they have found that not to be the case is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Now I want to I want to expound on something there because Generally, we have a very polite decorum in our meetings, and that's great. But because we do, it doesn't eliminate the, 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 the First Amendment things that the courts have stated, that it's heckling, applauding, uh, certain outbursts. But they've also ruled that any interruption has to be a significant interruption before it's even a problem. The First Amendment is most important, and it's supposed to be construed in favor of the exchange. Okay. Very narrowly for them being able to make you quiet. Because the exchange is part of our process, our Republican and Democratic process. And without that exchange, it allows them to manipulate things in their favor and exclude the public. Okay. And they certainly have tried to do that in the past, in my opinion. Oh, and I agree. Definitely. Uh, I've seen times, one, I was actually astonished that they limited public <coughs> comment to two minutes. Yes, yes. It, you know, I remember public comment at times being up to five minutes. Well, as far as I can recall, our um, city ordinance says five minutes, or five minutes. It does say five minutes. And there for years, they made it three minutes. Right. And, and I noted the ordinance said it's five minutes, and I brought it up. And, well, they corrected it, and they went, they went to five. But only before somebody had to speak up and, and you know, bring it up and force them to change it. So. You had some quotes that you wanted to share with us, Al, or did you want to do that? Yeah, uh, it's kind of re 
related uh, to to what we're talking about. Uh, but we, I don't know if we have enough time to get through all the quotes right now. Why don't we get to those right after the next break? Okay, well, I, I can remind people real quick, uh, something I was going to do later, but uh, obviously those watching the show, you know, it's great, but there are a lot of people that don't have the cable or the antenna. You can go to YouTube, type in uh, KZGN, and you'll see all the news programs and all the Ridgecrest talk programs. Uh, they usually get loaded up on YouTube within a day or two after yes. the shows. So. And if you just want to see, your <coughs> go, which I don't recommend, but if you want to go, just go straight to uh, Ridgecrest Talk, you can type that into the search right. bar in Utah. Okay. So you, All right. you can well, see Well, we're going to take YouTube. another break, uh, as we must. Come back and join us for this final segment, and we'll wrap things up here tonight. Glad you're joining us, too. Welcome back. Uh, we're in the last segment here at Ridgecrest Talk, Thursday night version with uh, Al Huey and Robert Ironman, and we're talking to Mike Neal and Ron Porter, and we're going to kind of wrap things up here uh, in this last segment. So, Ron, do you have anything more to add on the Brown Act that would be relevant to all of this? Well, there's just one thing that the court said that I thought was quite uh, really puts it all together. The loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal period of time unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. And what it, what it means by that is if, if someone has to come back later at another meeting when it's not fresh in people's minds, that's still an injury. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why the courts found that the First Amendment liberty was important to be given at that time, even if it causes disruption in meetings. Or causes a slight delay in the meeting. Slight delay. Yeah. I hate to call it disruption because. Well, yeah, but yeah. you're right. Well, they do have business to conduct, but uh, what was the question that you came up here recently for the candidates about uh, what was more important? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, simply what's more important is interchanging with your constituents, or is conducting business. And obviously, everybody would say, well, both of them are. No, I'm talking about when. You absolutely have to choose one or the other, and it's my contention that you should choose interchanging with your constituency is the most important part of the meeting. The other thing is, uh, kind of as a side to this, they tend to load the agendas up to such a degree that uh, they do run sometimes 11, 30, 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that is frustrating to the public, too, both those who are attending, sp specifically if what they want to talk about is way down on the agenda, you know. <laughs> so uh, they need to look at that, too. It's, it would be better for them and better for the public to try to keep it two, three-hour meeting at the max. It would be nice, but that's why they went to a 6 o'clock start time as opposed to, right. I think we used to start at 7, didn't we? 6.30? 7 o'clock. Anyway, they did go earlier to help that. Um. Okay, uh, Mike, do you want to wrap anything up here with what you've been talking about? Uh, I guess I'd just like, like to uh, say as far as what we were talking about earlier with uh, Mr. Lemieux acting like a sergeant in arms at the meeting, uh, there's really, there was really no resolution on that issue whatsoever. It was just justification for what he did, even though he apologizes, you know, he, that doesn't mean he's not going to do that again. I mean, he's clearly shown uh, several acts in the past that, for some reason, he he thinks it's it's his place to regulate the meeting if he thinks that somebody's getting out of line in his in his opinion. And so he he's not he has never hesitated to tell people they need to sit down and be quiet. They're out of they're out of line. You know, they're out of order. And, and now it's escalated to you know where he, he thought well the chief's not here so I need to go physically go over here and, and you know it would have been very interesting if he had made it over and got in front of Mr. Garver's face that could have been a real uncomfortable moment right 
Uh, and well, Mr. Councilman Holloway saved the day there by uh, immediately having a question, and, and that Scott stopped uh, uh, Mr. Lemieux. I don't know that there was anything that he even knew what was going on, but but it uh, was not apparent to those watching the video from the city. You can't tell where Mr. Garver is. No, only by when he actually gets to the podium, you can hear him clearer. So you assume that he's right there at the podium right. now. So, but but that's right. where he was heading, and that was his intention. Is to that's get where to Mr. Podium. Garver was heading. And right. That's where Mr. Lemieux was heading. Yes. And, and you know, to address your issue, Mike, you're right. We haven't gotten any re resolution. So let's no. do this. Let's invite the council, since maybe they watch this or they watch it later on YouTube, please, Ridgecrest City Council, address this issue and yes. make sure that our city attorney doesn't do this anymore. Absolutely. Right. It is only up to the mayor uh, to, to, to handle this. And please remember, Mayor, it's not a disruption if somebody applauds or if somebody boos or if somebody makes a three-word statement. That's not a disruption. And, and right. her last question to Ron, uh, mm -hmm. the council was with, is within their rights uh, to have their own rules of how they'll conduct themselves, right? It's limited. They, they have to make sure that they still comply with the First Amendment. Right. And, and in this case... But like what we're suggesting, to rather than wait later to comment on a public member saying something, address uh, it at that time. Yeah, absolutely. So they, they could in act or by resolution or however they would do it, I'm not sure, uh, how they will conduct business. Right. It's their, it's their choice how they're going to conduct right. business. Yeah, I don't even think they have to do anything except just do it. Right. But I, but I do want to comment on one thing Robert said, and that is that the disruption in a minute, even if it's five or ten minutes, it would still fall under a reasonable discussion and not necessarily a disruption of the meeting. Okay. It, it, it means a meaningful disruption of the meeting. Yes. If, if content's being brought forth, then it's not really, it's, it's not a lawful disruption, a, a criminal type thing. Right. Okay. We're down to the two minute mark, Al. All you, right. Uh, I, I do have these quotes I wanted to, to share with everybody, uh, and, and it, very appropriate to what we're discussing here. It was Wesley Clark who said, we need an America where debate and dissent and, and question your leaders and holding them accountable is the highest form of patriotism. And it was J. William Fulbright who said, in a democracy, dissent is an act of faith. And then you had one from Benjamin. Yes, Franklin. and it was Benjamin Franklin who said, it is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority. Right. Hear, hear. And I'll end it, uh, the quotes here with one. Uh, from Ari Fleischer, the former White House press secretary, who said that people have just got to watch what they say and do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before we run out of time, we do want to make sure that we commend the council. Absolutely. Uh, in last night's meeting, they did yeah. an excellent job, tremendous improvement, and so uh, we certainly hope that they continue on that path. Uh, I think that it, when they lead by example like that, they will get a response from the citizens which will uh, um, please them. Okay, real quick, again, some housekeeping information. Uh, you can go to YouTube, type in KZGN, and you can watch the news and Ridgecrest Talk. Uh, you can also, at KZGN.net, send an email to info at uh, KZGN.net and suggest a program for us. Uh, that's about all we can do for tonight. We hope you join us again next week here at Thursday at 6 o'clock. We'll be back with another show. Thanks for watching tonight. Good night.